I present to you my ideas on how our ancestors may have built large bronze objects like the pillars. Why? Because they play a prominent role within Freemasonic ritual, and I have an engineering background and this intrigues me. I will also explore the large bronze structure called the Molten Sea. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic Law. The pillars, Jarkin and Boaz, which were placed at the entrance to King Solomon's temple, are mentioned in our ritual and in many writings. For example, in the Bible, in 1 Kings 7, verse 21, and in 2 Chronicles, chapter 3, verse 17. They are also mentioned in an apocalyptic cyclopedia of advanced magical arts and alternate meanings, second edition, where they are given the meanings strength and beauty, among others. In the annotations to the Jerusalem Bible, which I will use as a reference referring to the pillars, it states that the two names are obscure, possibly it is firm and it is strong. Other writers have referred to them as cosmic pillars, like the pillars of Hercules, and as representing the twin mountains between which the sun was believed to emerge each morning. Much of what we know of our ancestors from before the time of Christ can be attributed to the study of ancient man as he lived in what could be called the Cradle of Civilization. That is the Middle East, the area described by Dr. Werner Keller in his book The Bible as History as the Fertile Crescent, reaching from the Persian Gulf to the Red Sea, encompassing the area of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers through to the Mediterranean Sea. 1 Kings 7 verses 13 to 26 together with 2 Chronicles 3 and 4, tells the story of a bronze worker, Huram Abi, Hiram Abif, who came from Tyre, an island on the coast of what is now Lebanon, but in those days was Phoenicia. We are told in our ritual that he was employed on the construction of King Solomon's temple and is emblematic of a great pillar. Huram Abi is described in 2 Chronicles 2 verse 14 as the son of a Danite woman by a Tyrian father. He is skilled in the use of gold, silver, bronze, iron, stone, wood, scarlet, violet, fine linen, crimson, in engravings of all kinds, and in the execution of any design suggested to him. In Kings, he is described as a widow's son from the tribe of Naphtali. Where he is from will not affect his work. He sounds like a versatile and clever worker. The purpose here, however, is to concentrate on his bronze work. To quote from 1 Kings 7 verse 15, he cast two bronze pillars. The height of one pillar was 18 cubits, and a cord of 12 long gave the measurement of girth. So also was the second pillar. In Chronicles, the pillars are described as being 30 and 5 cubits high. As in many stories from the Old Testament there are inaccuracies, these will not affect what I am trying to show. To get an idea of what the exact length of a cubit is, is not an easy task, as there are cubits and cubits. World Book Encyclopedia says about a cubit, It was based on the length of a man's arm from the tip of the middle finger to the elbow. No one knows when this measurement was established. The Egyptian cubit was 21 inches, the Roman cubit was 17.5 inches, and the Hebrew cubit was 17.58 inches. In the English system, the cubit is 18 inches. My measurement is 19.75 inches, or 50 centimetres. The People's New Testament of 1891 says, A cubit, somewhat more than 1 foot 9 inches English that is, 21 inches or 53 centimetres. From biblical weights and measures, as described by the First Church of the Nazarene, a cubit is 50 centimetres. 
In the Jerusalem Bible, the cubit is given as 18 inches or 45 centimeters. As already stated, I will use the Jerusalem Bible as my reference as to what the truth is. Academic argument will not change the concept I am trying to develop. I will therefore use this measurement, which is a cubit of 45 centimeters. The metric measurements of the pillars from 1 Kings 7 verse 15 are 8.1 meters in height and circumference of 5.4 meters. Traditionally, we are told that the pillars were hollow. I have been unable to find out if this is true or not. For the pillars to be solid, the mass would be enormous. In my research, it has also been suggested by some scholars that the pillars could have been built of timber and then gilded. Colin Brecon, in his paper, The Building of Solomon's Temple, says, on page 8, Boaz could be a corruption of the now obsolete word bows or boss, which at one time meant hollow. This hypothesis would make a lot of sense and solve many problems. Despite all this, I will assume that the pillars were cast, bronze, and hollow. Also, in my research, some scholars have suggested that the pillars could have been cast in sections, each fitting one into the other, similar to the construction of a stone pillar. This theory has a lot going for it, as the problems of handling large quantities of molten metal would be reduced to more manageable proportions, as would the transport of the castings. He also made other large castings. 1 Kings 7 verse 23 He made a sea of cast metal ten cubits from rim to rim, circular, and five cubits high. A cord of thirty cubits long gave the measurement of its girth. That is a bowl that is 4.5 metres in diameter and 2.25 metres deep. Twelve cast bronze oxen, three for each side of a square, supported this bowl. My research has revealed that there is no agreement on the shape of the sea. A. Zwiedoff, in his computer program The Molten Sea, states that the sea is cup-shaped. His program tries to answer the claim that the Bible says that pi is equal to three. In Asimov's Guide to the Bible, Isaac Asimov remarked, The exact function of the molten sea is not stated, though it seems most likely that it was a container for water used in the various rituals. The interesting point is that its upper rim seems to be circular in shape, with a diameter of 10 cubits and a circumference of 30 cubits. This is impossible, for the ratio of the circumference of the diameter, a ratio called pi by mathematicians, is given here as 30 over 10, or 3, whereas the real value of pi is an unending decimal which begins 3.14159, etc. If the molten sea were really 10 cubits in diameter, it would have to be just under 31 and a half cubits in circumference. The explanation is, of course, that the biblical writers were not mathematicians or even interested in mathematics, and were merely giving approximate figures. Still, to those who are obsessed with the notion that every word in the Bible is infallible, and who know a little mathematics, it is bound to come as a shock to be told that the Bible says that the value of pi is 3. Consider the following possibilities which I offer for your consideration. The shape of the following illustration equates to the description in the scripture. The first is oval shaped. The layout consists of two semicircles with a diameter of 8.76 cubits separated by a rectangle 1.24 cubits wide. At its widest point A to B, this C measures 8.76 plus 1.24, 10 cubits, from brim to brim. Its circumference is 8.76 times pi, plus 1.24, plus 1.24, 30 cubits. Is this oval the best solution to the problem? Probably not. Maybe we can consider a circular C, but look at it in three dimensions. We know it had a rim, so it was somewhat narrower just under the rim. Therefore, it could easily have measured 10 cubits from brim to brim, yet have been only 9.55 cubits wide at the waist, where it took a line 30 cubits long to go round it, because 9.55 times pi equals 30. Josephus, 
who was originally known as Joseph ben Matthias, the commander of Jewish insurgents at Joppa at the time of Emperor Nero, wrote in his work, The Antiquities of the Jews. Solomon also cast a brazen sea, the figure of which was a hemisphere. I have assumed, therefore, that the sea was a hemisphere, or one half of a sphere, and my calculations reflect this. The argument as to the exact shape of the sea will not change the hypothesis I am trying to develop. Singer et al. on page 633, when commenting on the casting of the bronze articles mentioned in Kings and Chronicles, says, It has been estimated that the brazen sea alone weighed 200 tons. I will dispute this statement later. One can see, however, that we are dealing with large castings and heavy quantities of metal. This metal must be handled and melted and handled again. In 2 Chronicles 4, verses 17 to 18, the king made them by the process of sand casting in the Jordan area between Succoth and Zeradan. Solomon made all these articles in great quantities, no reckoning being made of the weight of the bronze. Let us now look at these castings and see what we can make of them. We are told that the height is 8.1 metres and the circumference is 5.4 metres. The thickness of the pillar, we are told, is a hand's breadth. My hand's breadth is 97 millimetres. However, the Jerusalem Bible says that a hand's breadth, or palm, is 72 millimetres, so I will use this value in my calculations. All calculations have been rounded to the nearest whole number. The maths is shown here. How much bronze is in the pillar? 3 cubic metres. How much did it weigh? 27 metric tons. If the pillar had been cast in sections, say 10 sections, each 81 centimetres long, then each would have weighed 2.7 tons. This is far more believable than one casting. The technology for melting and handling large amounts of molten metal and successfully casting the same was just not available at this time in history. Even at 2.7 tons, credibility is stretched. My investigations and discussions with a professor of archaeometallurgy brought the response of total disbelief that the people of the Bronze Age were able to cast bronze weighing tons. Tyler Coate, in his work The Coming of the Age of Iron, discussing the size of castings, says about the Chu dynasty in China of 770 BCE, a bronze cauldron found at Anyang in 1946 weighed 1,400 kilograms and was about one metre across. Of course, these may have been the product of good organisation rather than large capacity, smelting and melting. Earlier, I made mention of the sea sometimes referred to as the Molten Sea or Brazen Sea, the size of which was 4.5 metres in diameter and 2.25 metres deep and a hand's breadth in thickness. These measurements suggested that it is one half of a sphere. We can therefore calculate both the volume of bronze and the capacity of the bowl. 1 Kings 7.26 tells us that it held 2,000 baths. Chronicles tells us, however, that the sea held 3,000 baths. These inconsistencies I leave for each of you to consider. The measurements for liquids used in the Bible are the words sea, core, and bath. A core is equal to 450 litres, and a bath is one-tenth of a core, or 45 litres. However, we have variations from this measurement as well. The People's New Testament states the bath, the tenth of a core, or seven gallons and four pints and a half. Using US gallons, that's 28 litres. Using Imperial gallons, that's 34 litres. One can assume that US gallons were used in this version. According to the First Church of the Nazarene, one bath is equal to 22 litres. All these translators seem to believe that their version is the correct one. The capacity of the sea would then be equal to 2,000 times 45, or 90,000 litres, on the assumption that a bath was, in fact, 45 litres. On looking at this, it does not seem quite right 
as my swimming pool holds 67,000 litres and is much bigger. We will see what the calculations tell us later. On the other hand, if a bath is equal to 22 litres, then the capacity would be 2,000 times 22, or 44,000 litres. This is quite a deal different. I will not describe all the maths I used, but it is summarised here. With reference to the statement of Singer earlier, I cannot make the sea 200 tonnes given the availability of current data. His statement, I believe, is just a bad guess unless he considered the mass of the water in it as well. Even so, the capacity of the sea would affect the total mass given that one litre of water weighs one kilogram. The capacity of the sea is calculated as follows. One cubic metre is equal to 1,000 litres of water. The sea's capacity would therefore be 22 metres cubed times 1,000, or 22,000 litres. Compare this with the 90,000 litres, or indeed 44,000 litres. One of the big problems associated with references in the Bible translations is the fact that the numbers just do not add up. We must also remember that the writers were writing on their perceptions, and their knowledge was limited. We have read in Kings that the sea held 2,000 baths. If the calculations are correct, then a bath would be equal to 11 litres. One can see the difficulties in determining the truth when using ancient writings. I do not know the truth, and my research has shown that scholars in this area either do not agree or are guessing. I will leave the discrepancies for you to ponder. Now we must try to answer the following questions. Where did these people get the ore? How did they smelt it? How did these people melt all this metal? Where did they do it? How did they make the moulds? How did they get the molten metal to the moulds? How did they get the finished product to the site? And then, how did they erect the pillars and the sea? To find answers to these questions, we must look at what archaeology tells us about early metalworking. Humans have used metal for only the last 12,000 years, a much shorter time span than the period in which stone was used for tools, weapons, and ornaments. The McGraw-Hill Encyclopedia of Science and Technology tells us, The earliest datable finds of human altered metal are small copper objects from sites in the Near East, including a pendant from Shanadir in Iraq dated around 9500 BC. Copper was used this time in the Middle East and prehistoric Europe for jewellery and in a ritual religious ceremony. The first coins were made and used in Asia Minor in the early part of 7000 BCE. Smelting was discovered in the middle 5000s BCE. At this time, trade in metals was taking place so metals not found naturally in one place were traded with those peoples who had them. Copper was available from mines in the Arabah. Tin was traded with the British who mined it at Cornwall. Other metals as well as tin were alloyed, arsenic, antimony and lead, each used for particular purposes. Knowledge of smelting led to the mixing of metals and the discovery that this alloying made a better metal than either of those mixed. Primitive bronze has been excavated and dates as far back as 3000 BCE. As copper melts at a temperature of 1080 degrees Celsius, high heat was needed and a means of forcing air to make the fire hotter had to be invented. The furnace was developed. A good example of these early furnaces was discovered at Timna. These were dated at between 1200 and 1400 BC. Ingots of copper have been found. Of the ingots that have been found, some have solidified in the furnace and others have been made by being poured into oxhide moulds. These ingots weighed between 30 and 40 kilograms with a thickness of 4 centimetres. The production of bronze by mixing copper and tin was an established practice throughout the Eurasian landmass by 1500 BCE. In those times, Bronze was used mainly for weapons and cutting tools. 
swords, axes, spears, arrowheads, adzes, and shields, although bowls and cauldrons were also made from bronze. To make bronze castings, the following things are essential. Oars, fuel, blast air and tools, furnaces and crucibles, and, of course, a mould. Forbes, in Metallurgy and Antiquity, says, The oars were most plentiful and of good quality, in the ancient Near East and further, but the fuel was often rather a problem. For the quantity, and above all the quality of the fuel, determined to a large extent the temperature attained in the furnace, and this again is largely responsible for the possibility of working certain ores and of using certain processes. In other words, the fuel determines to a certain degree the smelting and melting activities of the early smith. What then of this fuel problem? To overcome this problem, smelting was done close to a supply of appropriate fuel. We are all aware of the desert nature of the area we are discussing. Was this always so? R.J. Forbes says, It has been proved that the Romans used 21.8 kilograms of wood to roast 1 kilogram of ore, and an additional 68.5 kilograms of wood for smelting and refining. One third of the fuel was wood and the remainder charcoal. One kilogram of charcoal has a calorific value equal to that of 90.2 kilograms of wood. That is burning an awful lot of wood. One can assume that Hiram would have needed similar quantities. Studies done in similar climates have shown that one acre of land grew 125 trees and 9,000 kilograms of fuel were produced from each 40-year-old tree. A tree bearing area of 0.8 of an acre was required for each one ton of copper. In modern times, we know that this area is rich in oil. Could these people have found on the surface quantities of pitch? Writing in the Palestine Quarterly, Menashe Ha'ur states, Smelting and casting of the metal was usually done near the mines, and mainly in the vicinity of the sources of forest wood, and apparently utilised the strands of Haloxian Pespiriscum, which were common in the region, and reached heights of 3 to 5 metres. These plants have almost completely disappeared today. Stands of Quercus caloprinos, a slow-growing oak, and Juniperius fetisha, a softwood juniper tree from altitudes of 1,000 to 1,600 metres, reached heights of 10 metres and more. They grew in the western Edom Mountains and were cut and converted to charcoal and transported to the smelting sites by camel and donkey caravans. Early smelting was carried out with a variety of primitive furnaces. This usually burnt charcoal, but other fuels were also burnt including dung, date seeds, brush, etc. For the melting of scraps of metal in crucibles, usually a fired clay bowl, a ring of stones, a pile of hot charcoal, and a clay tuya, a ceramic tube, connected to the bellows, are all that would be required. The melting of large quantities of metal, however, is another matter. This was possibly done by using multiple furnaces adjacent to the mould in the ground, with channels leading from each furnace into the mould between the furnaces. This would enable the quantity of the molten metal needed for the pour to be cast before the metal solidified. Werner Keller describes an excavation that was made by Nelson Glurk in the 1940s in an area known as Wadi El Araba. The excavation site was at Ezion Geber, also known as Elath, and today called Elat. In the middle of a square-walled enclosure, an extensive building came into view. The green discoloration on the walls has left no doubt as to the purpose of the building. It was a blast furnace. The mud-brick walls had two rows of openings. They were flues. A skillful system of air passages was included in the construction. The whole thing was proper, up-to-date blast furnace, built in accordance with the principle that celebrated its resurrection in the modern industry a century ago as the Bessemer system. Flues and chimneys both lay along a north to south axis, for the incessant winds and storms from Wadi el Arabah had to take the role of bellows. The Arabah 
is an extension of the Great Rift Valley that goes from Africa through the Red Sea to the Gulf of Aqaba and on to the Dead Sea. And Glurk says about the site of Ezion Geber, and shelter under the lee of the hills from the fierce winds which blow down the centre of the funnel-like rift of the Wadi Arabah. The bronze workers used this wind to operate as a natural blast for their furnaces. That was 3,000 years ago. Today we use compressed air. In the same area were discovered smelting pots with a capacity of 14 cubic feet or 1.3 cubic metres. I believe the foregoing tells us how this bronze could have been produced and the metal melted before being placed into a mould. Whilst this description does give an idea of where and how a furnace could operate, this area is many kilometres from Jerusalem and may or may not have been the site for Solomon's bronze work. Scholars are still debating this. The site is also far away from where Sukkoth is believed to have been. To make up the castings, a mould is required to get the shape needed, be it pillars, the sea, or any of the other articles previously mentioned. Man has used various moulds in the past. An open mould made in stone and clay was common for such things as axes and arrowheads. A two-piece mould was used for more complex moulds like sword handles. To make more elaborate shapes, a method called the lost wax technique was used. This involved the forming of the desired shape in wax and then enclosing the wax model in fine clay, but leaving a small channel to the exterior. When the clay is heated, the melted wax can be poured out, thus the clay becomes a hollow mould and molten metal can be poured into it. After it is cooled, the clay can be broken away and one is left with a metal copy of the original. We, however, must look at a mould of very much larger proportions. As previously mentioned, the Bible says that the castings were made by the process of sand casting. Singer says that moulding in clay was the principal process for casting in antiquity. I've described a furnace found in the Arabah and how the prevailing winds were used to assist in the smelting. Singer continues, where he goes on to give us a description of the area and the method of building these castings. The soil is a marl with patches of clay. It is clear that the moulds were excavated in one of these patches. There is no mention in the Hebrew text that any special clay was used. Such vast moulds could hardly have been constructed in any other way. This is only one small step beyond the method already used in Egypt and common elsewhere of supporting clay moulds by burying them in the ground before the furnace. This would allow the molten metal to be poured directly from the smelter to the mould, with channels from several furnaces to different parts of the mould, to ensure an even distribution of the melt. Singer goes on with a description of the construction of the mould for the sea or great bowl. In front of the furnace, a pit was dug. To, to an arm pivoted at its centre, a template was attached, the outer edge being curved to the profile of the basin, so that, when the arm swung around the pivot, the template described the desired shape. Ropes, probably of straw, were laid on the floor and up the sides of the pit, and then covered with well-beaten clay and broken pots. The ropes provided vents for the escape of the gases evolved when the molten metal was poured into the mould. The space between the walls and the floor of the pit and the edge of the template was gradually filled up with more clay and broken bricks or pots, the template being moved around as required. The outermost quarter inch or so of the filling was a more finely textured clay suitable for modelling the decorative borders of the bowl, like the brim of a cup or the flower of a lily. The clay surface was allowed to dry slowly, cracks being stopped up with more clay. The construction of the core for the inner surface of the basin was now considered. This core would be suspended within the mould and only a hand's breadth above it. A framework of metal supports would be placed to keep it in position. After drying, the mould and channels leading to it from the furnaces would be well baked and heated with charcoal so that the metal would not become chilled. When the glowing coals had been swept out, sections of the inner mould were firmly fixed in place, lest it should float upon the molten metal. The mould was now ready for the metal. 
I must repeat that my investigations and discussions with a professor of archaeometallurgy brought the response of total disbelief that the people of the Bronze Age were able to cast bronze weighing tons. I therefore offer my work as a possibility given the evidence of the written word. The method of casting the pillars would have been similar. These could have been made vertical, with the outside part done first, with whatever decoration desired. The core could have then been built up in the middle with the appropriate hand's breadth left for the molten bronze. However, if the mould were the full 8.1 metres, the pressure of the molten metal at the base, together with its depth, would have made a successful cast unlikely. Also, it would be difficult to get the melt in fast enough for even solidifying. When solidified, they could have been dug up. Even so, it still would have been a major task to move. Possibly it was done with a timber framework and levers. No doubt there was plenty of manpower. It appears to me that, if the hypothesis that the pillars were cast in sections is accepted, then the construction of the mould, or moulds, would have to be easier. There would be less metal in the melt and handling, and it would not be so hard. Stone pillars were built in this way for the same handling reasons. We now must look at how these huge castings were taken to the temple. From the map of Israel it can be seen that the distance from the smelters located at Succoth, which is near the river Jabbok, is a considerable distance from Jerusalem. In addition to this, Werner Keller tells us that at Tel Deir Allah, in Transjordan, where the river Jabbok leaves the hills six miles before it joins the Jordan, the expedition discovered traces of Succoth, the Israelite city, dating to the days of Joshua. This is adjacent to the Wadi El Arabah. The Arabah is 166 kilometers or 103 miles in length, from the Gulf of Aqaba to the southern shore of the Dead Sea, and is part of the 6,000 mile long African Rift Valley. Goods in those days were transported on the backs of asses or camels. Horses and chariots were well known, but the horses were not the heavy draft horses of today. They were fairly light horses, and with primitive harness in use at that time, pulling a fairly light chariot with one or two men in it, it was probably as much as they could do. What then of bullock carts? There is evidence of their use in India as long ago as 4000 BCE. Were they used in biblical times? Oxen are mentioned in biblical writings. We must therefore question just how big a load could have been moved. There is, of course, evidence of man moving large objects, the pyramids, Stonehenge in South America and Asia. But how? We can and have theorized. Here I've tried to be as practical as I can be. Asses and camels have been used by the Israelites and others for transporting goods for hundreds of years. I think it is safe to assume that animals were used to transport the castings from the foundry to Jerusalem. The carrying capacity of an ass probably does not exceed 100 kilograms. A camel, on the other hand, can carry up to about 270 kilograms. Further, this load would have to be in two equal parts, one on each side of the animal. So, we get back to castings of no more than 50 kilograms about the maximum load of a single furnace. Then there is the biblical statement that the casting was done in the plain of the Jordan River between Succoth and Zarathan. These are in the Rift Valley, about 35 kilometers from Jerusalem and about 25 kilometers from where the Jordan enters the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is about 1,290 feet or 393 meters below sea level. The foundry was probably some 1100 to 1150 feet or 335 to 350 meters below sea level. Jerusalem is about 2700 feet or 822 meters above sea level. So transporting the castings involved a climb of some 3800 feet or 1158 meters through rugged country where the road consisted of a dirt track. Probably not much wider in places than the space taken by a man leading a loaded ass. This, I believe, would preclude the use of any form of wheeled transport for goods being taken to or from the foundry. So again, we get back to asses, each carrying two castings of not more than about 50 kilograms each. 
Bronze, when cast, takes the form of the mould very accurately. It would have been relatively easy for the artisans of King Solomon's time to make moulds sufficiently accurate for the resultant castings to fit together closely. The pillar, or other object thus formed, would appear to the casual observer to be one piece. We know that King Solomon had many horses and chariots. 1 Kings 10 verses 26 to 29 Solomon built up a force of chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses. One could ask, given the above, could chariots have been used to transport the castings? Given the hypothesis that the castings were small, then joined together by rivets or something else, some of these questions could have an answer. Were these objects constructed and raised gradually in place? Were they assembled and then lifted? There are many theories as to how heavy objects were raised. The pillars had to be lifted on their base and stood up, then fixed down. Levers could be used to raise them a small amount, then wedges and blocks inserted, and the process repeated until the required height was achieved. The construction of heavy timber scaffolding at the side of the object to be raised allowed lifting by cables affixed to levers. Whatever the method used, it would have been laborious. We can only wonder at the ingenuity of our forefathers. In conclusion, trying to get at the exact truth of what happened all that time ago is difficult. Many assumptions must and have been made. On reflection, I have asked more questions than I have answered. I do not know how close this paper is to what was done by the tradies of King Solomon, but as a suggestion as to what was done, it is probably as good as any. For more Masonic podcasts, videos, music, texts and artwork, visit fromthequarries.com or subscribe to our YouTube, Twitter and Facebook accounts by searching From the Quarries. Thank <laughs> you.